but it's more when you know this person is so powerful that however you respond, and even if you do respond, you may be wondering for the rest of your career how they have processed it and decided to deal with it against you. Hi, Professor Green. It's great to see you. Hi, glad to be here. Hi. Um, so I'd like us to start by talking about uh, the legal definition of harassment. Could you tell us what that is? There's a landmark case, um, Meritor Savings Bank, where the Supreme Court talks about sexual harassment. It, it talks about unwelcome um, activity of a severe or pervasive nature um, that affects terms and conditions of employment. How do courts think about unwelcomeness in the workplace versus consent? So when we think about sexual harassment and uh, the issue of it being unwelcome, um, that's a little bit different than when we think about a criminal act where you ask the question, did the, the person, the victim, consent to this behavior? Uh, in Meritor Savings is probably a, a good example. Um, the uh, plaintiff female had, had sexual activity with the supervisor involved uh, dozens of times because she felt she had to do it um, to preserve her job status. Now, that might be consensual in some aspects, but under the Title VII definition, it's not looking at it from that perspective. It's whether it was unwelcome for her to have been exposed to that kind of situation where she felt she had to do it to keep her job. And the court, of course, in fact, found that to be unwelcome behavior. They did. In your paper, you mentioned a standard of empathy that you think could be incorporated into the consent um, to the idea of consent. Do you think that that's connected somehow to this unwelcome thing? Can you say more about this empathy piece? The empathy should be looking at the vulnerable employee who is has no choice, really. And I, I talk about this a little bit. Once that executive makes this overture, the options are really limited and quite daunting for that person. Even if they are positive in their mind that they want to have a relationship with that executive, uh, the, the options are just not that great wherever they go. And that's where the empathy needs to, to lie when something does go awry and that person does come forward and makes a complaint that's where we should be empathetic in terms of how we analyze those things. I'm not preventing the executive from still defending himself or herself from saying that I didn't harass this person or I didn't uh, do anything improper. I'm just taking out the one little part about consent yes. by, because they didn't say no. Um, that's the only part I'm taking out. I do feel like the reason this is a hot button, button issue is because the crux of these disputes in these situations is, is, is rarely like, you know, the, the victim um, was making it up. I mean, these, these disputes almost always revolve around admitting to have engaged in the conduct and then coming and then having a dispute over the meaning of the conduct. I've seen this at universities, too, in terms of policies and relationships with uh, students and faculty and other things and there's talk about adults being adults and allowing people to make decisions as long as they're informed google uh, has developed a little policy where you only get one ask oh is that right want, yeah. that. that was funny yeah so you get one ask if you want to ask somebody out or whatever you get one ask and whatever their response is it could be ambiguous whatever it is you don't get to ask again so um Going back to me too, um, what was like the dumbest like excuse that you heard from an executive who was accused of harassment and why do you think it was dumb? I think what probably spurred me to write this paper um, is Tavis Smiley. Um, okay. And so uh, he made comments like, what's wrong with dating people in the workplace? and where else are you going to go to find love? And uh, Barack and Michelle met in the workplace. So what's wrong with that? Um, 
and even admitted that he owns his own company and has dated several people who work for him and never at once acknowledged the potential power differentials that are involved in all of that. And then, of course, there's Les Moonves from CBS. So if you look at the paper, I start off with two comments from both of them. Um, and where Les Moonves uses that no means no, and that he understood that. But yet there was one situation where he admitted that a physician treating him, he tried to kiss the physician. And it was just so shocking to me. And I guess he would have said, well, as soon as she said no, I would have stopped. But what person thinks that a doctor coming to treat them, that that's your first step is to just kiss them? I mean, I do think there are probably people in the world who are like, that seems reasonable to me. Like, why do you find it outrageous? What, what seems reasonable well, to me? I mean, okay, other than the, like... My doctor like, comes up and doctor, wants to kiss me? Like, the other, like, Tavis Smiley's thing. Like, yeah, I meet people in the workplace. Like, that's my thing. Like, why do you find that outrageous? The thing with Tavis Smiley is, is, is more just the complete, blatant, unaware position. And kind of what uh, Jennifer was just talking to me about, like, the empathy. There's a lacking of empathy whatsoever for what the position the vulnerable person is in, uh, that's more. Sh it was more shocking to me that he was so openly blatant about what's wrong with this. So you really focus on that class of one that class of relationship that's supervisor subordinate or executive subordinate. To, to be at an executive level in a major corporation, you not only affect that person's terms and conditions of employment in that corporation, but maybe in their whole career and in industry. And I highlight a couple of instances in the paper, some of them involving uh, Harvey Weinstein, where you know the the, uh, the argument even and Les Moonves said this too. You know he never did anything, but when they have such power you're not in a position to even know how they can be harming you by even just uh, being innocuous when someone asks them what they think about you as an, a former employee. Anita Hill talked a lot about that when she was questioned about Clarence Thomas and why she stayed in contact with him after her allegations against him. Um, you know, we have sort of help this problem become a problem in ADR with our secret agreements and our confidentiality clauses. And now we just hear about um, Jeffrey Epstein getting that plea bargain that made it so that, he, you know, so he was able to, to get away with very bad behavior. And I noticed there were no ADR prescriptions in your paper. I wonder if that was, you know, is that because you don't think there are alternative dispute resolution mechanisms that would help? I've written about this a little bit in terms of uh, criticisms of, of ADR because it is private and that there are some types of disputes that do require a public resolution. And with the Me Too movement, um, some of the things that we're seeing, the, it, because of how people have been silenced for so long, it, it needs to be public. What role do you think men play in, or can play or should play in the Me Too movement? Um, I try to highlight, there's one section where I talk about how um, women can be the harassers. Um, and you can have vulnerable boys and men who are subjected uh, to the same concerns that I have. Um, and, and so, I may not look at it as just what can men do, what can when other people do, but in general, what should we all be doing when it comes to uh, looking at this? And I go back to the empathy, and I think the Me Too movement is certainly helping that by bringing out, um, as Catherine McKinnon said, where now people are listening to the stories that people come forward with instead of assuming that they're not true. And we all need to be sensitive men and women in terms of how we interact with each other in the workplace um, when there are power differentials. Mm -hmm.